Murphy. Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big Porky here, the voice of hardcore boxing. But you already know that, don't you? Because that's why you've tuned in. Today, I'm joined by Rico, my close friend from London, who started the channel with me 38 months ago. How are you doing, Rico? Good, mate. And you've got to two million, so congratulations. I know. That's a good feat, isn't it? Yeah, we, we're plodding on. We're only a small little channel, but we're making big waves. <laughs> it's a bit like Terry said, and I've been saying to you uh, off camera that it's easier to get now to four and then from there. Yeah. It's going to double, isn't it? The more followers you have. And I hope everybody that's watching subscribes because you get all that porky contents uh, recommended on YouTube, all the uh, porky raging and, you know, all that stuff. So. It's, yeah. all worth a, it's all worth a look, isn't it? It's a bit a different voice to boxing and it's the hardcore way. And whether you agree with everything Ross says or not, that's up to you. But at least it gets those uh, brains thinking a bit differently and looking at things in a different perspective. So I think that's what the channels was set up to do. And that's what it's been doing for the last few years. Yeah, I'm pleased that uh, obviously you know, we check on analytics and that and a lot of... Uh nearly 70% of my subscribers now are all sharing the sharing the videos on the WhatsApp and you know on Facebook and Twitter and all that and things like that so I think that's good isn't it yeah and the zoom has been a game changer you've become the Arsenal fan TV of uh, boxing by you know oh. getting all these different different characters uh to give their views on what's going on and I think it's quite a good format and it's a bit different to what others are doing. So if others are interviewing boxing, getting the access, giving fans an opportunity to contribute and share their voices. And then you've got the common cast of guests, whether it's yeah. me, Terry, the, the voice of hardcore pay-per-view, Dale the Greats, and a number of others, Gripping Tap and everyone Gripping else. Gripping Tap's all right, lad. I went to see yeah. him the other day. <laughs> <laughs> He's some boy, him. But yeah, uh, I'm going to be like... Uh... Claude off Arsenal TV. <laughs> you like, uh, what's it called? Robbie, the guy that does all the interviews. So you like him that brings them all together. So he puts time, I guess, doesn't he? That Robbie puts the time in, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I, I think, uh, actually, uh, funnily enough, it, it was uh, IFL they inspired him to do. So it's uh, he was quite close to Coogan, I understand, and inspired him to come up with the idea. And I think that concept really taken off in football and you have guys like Troops from Arsenal Fan TV that's now on Barstool Sports and does his own podcast and you know I guess there's opportunities for anybody that wants to get involved whether they want to become more known as like boxing analyst or just give that fan perspective like Troops whether it's passionate or you know it's not the mainstream stuff that's been fed to us so I think it's all good. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, we, we've come a long way with this. I mean, yesterday we had a, a load of stuff fitted at, at my office. I'll be up there Tuesday. Just They've just got to put all Zoom apps and camera apps together. But the tower on it, big brand new thing. It's made out of glass, this tower. You know, like your thing that goes next to your, com your computer thing, isn't it? Yeah. And it's got like these multicolored things that all light up, keyboard and everything. And there's like a big, like an arm thing that comes off table, you know, for microphone and that and there's like a big circle thing in front of it whatever that's called and is that to stop sound and, and we'll whatever. maybe one day we'll do what they do on Arsenal fan TVs where they get all the characters together and you do a watch along and then you film the watch along yeah. and you know everybody can watch a big fight uh, and then give their opinions there and then so maybe yeah, we do bit, something like that one day it's a bit different to uh we sat in Dennis's office, we, uh, Liam and Chris Smedley and them in it, and <laughs> I was doing it in my shed in my old house in back where garden. You were doing, where you were doing weights in between as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, mess it. Oh, yeah, so it's all good stuff, and it? We're all, uh, we're, we're, we're all like a, a bit of a laugh, don't we? Because you've got to put a bit of comedy element into it, Rico, because some people are so serious. We're not yeah, all like Rob Tebbett, Mr. Serious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we can't be we can't be too serious about it. It's only boxing, isn't it? We're all passionate about it, but mm. we can, uh, yeah, I think we just need to have a laugh sometimes and look at the funny side of it. What do you think about uh, the Rob Tebbett, Tunde, Spencer Fear and Spat? 
Yeah, look, I, it's one of those things where I think it's obviously easy. Tunde is not very liked by many boxing fans, so it's easier to share his stuff out. But it doesn't always reflect well on the Rob Tebbett and the outlet. And some of you will know that I've written quite a lot for boxing social in the past. So, you know, I'm not going to be critical about the outlet. And, you know, I get along with writers from there. Some of them are my good mates, like Craig Scott and others. So I think... I think it's easier to do that, but it's one of those handbag things in block boxing that has got kind of blown up. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily the best thing for um, Rob in this instance, because depending on how other trainers take it, but he's got his mates in boxing and I'm sure that probably gained some brownie points from some people and others it didn't. Yeah. The expense of fear and kind of piling in and starting to get at it, it was more for him to grab attention around what he's doing and backing his guy Tunde. For some weird reason, Tunde's blocked me recently, although I've been always uh, supportive of him in the yard. It's just handbags, isn't it? It's, it's the drama that goes on when there's no boxing. People get so tied into all this other soap opera stuff, and I think it's the hernification of boxing, which is everything becomes a drama, and it's detracts away from the sport so we're not seeing good fights so everybody's focused on the ancillary stuff around what's actually happening outside beef, of the... isn't it? yeah exactly we've got journalists beefing with trainers and you know fighters tweeting and all this stuff like people yesterday going on about ryan garcia removing himself from twitter it's like it's not really the sport is it it's the only sport where everybody cares more about what's happening outside of the ring than actually in the ring because there's not much happening outside the ring and it all leads back to the point where we don't have good fights so there's not enough to care about in the sport, is there? No, no. Uh, moving on then, Mika. What do you think about Christopher Eubank Jr. signing with Scarface? <laughs> I, was, I was watching an Instagram live the other day with Christopher Eubank Jr. It, feel like, it felt like Kale was a massive fan of him as a guy, like his lifestyle, right, rather than actually him as a fighter. I mean, Chris Eubank Jr., right? He's been, um, he's been promoted by Matchroom, Frank Warren, the Sourlands, Hennessy, uh, Hennessy Heyman. and Heyman. Yeah, five promoters. He's done really well for himself, considering that he's lost most of his big fights. I think the Gale is probably the only one he hasn't lost, which is a big fight. Um, he obviously beat Yildrim. That's facing Canelo next. Um, I think he's, he's done well from a commercial perspective, not so much from a legacy perspective, but we have to give him credit for managing his own career and maximising his income. We're relatively, you know, I, I wouldn't say he's not talented, He's a, yeah. clearly a talented guy, but it's one of those things that's convenient for both parties. I reckon if Kale can't game a big fight in the next 18 months, he'll go somewhere else. Yeah. But he'll be on matchroom shows. That's the reality. You think he'll be on Kale, matchroom shows. You think that Kale will be just an outlet for Eddie? Yeah, and also, who does Kale have at 160, 168, where he can put on, you know, he'll be one of those, Calais will be getting him on other people's shows, whether that's PBC, Top Rank, Matchroom, um, even Frank Warren. He's neutral enough. He's not tied to any platform. So that means that, it just means that he's more of a free agent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you see Chris Eubank doing anything or do you see him just coming back for paydays? I think he probably wants another big fight. Um, but I just don't see where he fits in the bigger picture or the bigger landscape because 160, 168, Matchroom have most of the fighters. They're not fighting against each other, but they could make Chris Eubank Jr. against one of their guys, whereas a Billy Joe Saunders rematch or someone else, maybe in Beefy Smith, which he's mentioned, and that could be a pay per view. But then you're not risking one of your guys taking or one of your two guys taking a loss. Uh, I think Chris Eubank Jr. is a perfect opponent for a lot of these guys because of his limited boxing ability. He's and the fact that he can fight in two weight divisions. Yeah. So he's a perfect guy to get onto a show, get people behind. Um, massive ticket seller as well. 
um, not not by himself going to sell those tickets, but he's quite a big draw in British boxing. So I think he's a good guy to get in with a matchroom fighter or even someone like, you know, Liam Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that Beefy Smith against Chris Eubank's a good fight? Yeah, if they can settle on the weight, that's the thing. I mean, he's coming down from, he's really a 160 pounder, but I think it, I think it would be a good fight if it happened. But is that the weight that Beefy wants to campaign? And I think the big question is, what does that fight lead to? Because it's not for a title. Yeah. Like, what, what, like, if they can get it for, you know, a final eliminator, then it probably makes sense. But they need to sort of think about where does that fight lead the winner to, rather than having us just one-off fights and then be back there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Do you feel that Chris Eubank Jr. is a big star now and he doesn't need a belt for it to get on pay-per-view? A bit like Dylan White. I mean, he's a big star in Britain, yeah. He, you know, he's a big draw. But, I mean, for his career, he needs a belt. because otherwise So a domestic never... fight then, a domestic fight as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, otherwise, he's the perfect... I wouldn't call him a stepping stone because he's not a guy that he's not like a guy that you can beat easily and get a good ranking or recognition, but he's a perfect guy that you sort of match in a fight that draws eyeballs and people are interested in. Relatively low risk. Uh, he sells the fight off his own back because he's, you know, a big social media draw and he's oh. Chris Eubank's son, right? So he's a perfect opponent. Does he need a belt for his career? He does. I mean, what has he ever... One apart from the IBO, like what's his biggest win? Kobarov, who got injured in the first round, or yeah. De Gale, who was washed up at that point. Abraham. Abraham, yeah, Abraham probably. Washed Maybe. up. He was washed up though, wasn't he? Exactly. Do you feel that he's took a lot of his dad's traits from him, whereas you only want to fight guys that are over the hill and that kind of thing? But an yeah, I, I do think. Yeah, I mean, look, he's a smart kid. He went to fight in college, so it's not like he's your average boxer in many ways. Yeah. He, he's there to maximise his money, and also he's managed to maximise his profile. I mean, after his career's done, watch the space. He'll be on some sort of celebrity TV shows. Uh, he's already been on Goggle Box, hasn't he? So he's he's in Vegas at the moment, hanging out with Dan Bilzerian. Uh, playing poker with all these celebrities. You know, he's that's the lifestyle he really wants to do. Boxing's his vehicle to get there. Yeah. Uh, all right, then. Uh, let me have a look what we've got on agenda. Canelo to Matchroom. Well, it depends how you want to look at that. I mean, what's Matchroom actually going to do for Canelo? He's already got a promoter, Canelo, hasn't he? Don't they promote he's themselves? Yeah, I mean, they the it's a it's similar to a deal that they did with Triple G, where they'll put on the undercard. Eddie holds a license in the states that they need to run the events. He'll do the press conferences, the promotions. He'll probably take a smaller cut than he usually does. It's good for Eddie's brand recognition. It's probably it was probably a toss up between fighting against. Someone on a PBC card and Caleb Plant versus fighting against, well, Yildrim sure. and Caleb Plant versus fighting Yildrim and probably Billy Joe Saunders. Caleb That's Plant's probably. a nightmare for Canelo, isn't he? I think he's a nightmare for anyone. I don't think he necessarily beats Canelo, but he's not the fight that you want to be in because he's never going to look particularly good on you. Would you say Canelo's a bit of a cherry picker? I, you know what? I think that would be... That wouldn't be fair. I mean, look, he faced Callum Smith, who was the best 168 pounder in the world. Uh, Kovalev. He's faced Kovalev. He's faced Triple G twice. Why won't he face B, B to Beef? Well, we don't ask many fighters to step up from, you know, two weight classes to fight again. Well, he did to fight Kovalev, didn't he? So while you're there, why don't you fight B to Beef? Yeah, look... B to B is a guy that he punches very hard. He'll probably take years of your career, even if you win that fight. Yeah. Uh, if you if you lose, you're not. If you win, you're probably not going to get the credit you deserve because he's a guy that's known by the hardcore boxing fans. If you 
lose, you'll be criticised for doing it. It's a lose-lose situation in many ways. Like, it, does, it doesn't do much for him. I don't think, you know, when we're talking about pound for pound, you look at Canelo, he's actually gone through the weights and has beat the best guys or, you know, near enough the best guys. I don't think we can ask for more. Like, we're not asking 147 fighters to go up to 160 and fight. Like, Kell Brook, when he went up to 160 and fight against triple, fought against Triple G, we all said it was a bad decision. So, I think with Canelo... He actually mostly beats a one four one seven five champion, and I think he's done enough. Like he doesn't need to go up there. There's enough challenge at one sixty. He hasn't cleared that division up. You've still got Plant. You've got Charlo. Uh, there's more guys to go there. Mm. Billy Joe Saunders one six eight. Another fight that's good and people want to see. All right then. Uh... Amir Khan, Kelbrook, Beefy Smith, Eubank, all that in the mix. Although you wouldn't put Khan in that mix for Eubank, but the others have been spoke about by people in industry. How do you see that playing out? The the, the Kelbrook, uh, Eubank, and Kelbrook, Beefy, and Kelbrook Khan, that little, little round robin thing. How do you see that? I think I side with our mutual friend Terry here, where I agree that Khan doesn't want to give. Brook to fight because if Brook doesn't fight against Khan, who can he fight against that we interested in or does good numbers? So I don't think Khan's going to give that. Khan's obviously been focused on non boxing stuff for the last few years. Um, you know, he probably doesn't need the money. I don't think he's got probably enough income from outside of boxing, not needing the money to fight against Kell Brook and give Kell Brook the opportunity in the payday. And also, it's not, it's not a fight that really interests that many people anymore. Um, Beefy Smith, Kelbrook, I could see that happening. I think that would be a good fight, and I can see that happening. Uh, if Kelbrook wants a, yeah, if Kelbrook wants another fight, maybe he'll come up, well, he'll come back to you know, light middleweight and fight against, or super welterweight, and he'll fight against um, Beefy Smith. I think that's a perfect fight for both of them. Uh, that's a perfect yeah. fight that could headline a UK card and bring some intrigue. Yeah. Where do you see uh, Eddie's role in all this with Brooke, Khan? Because there were fallouts, weren't there? But he's gone running back to him. And he, um, you know, I've heard that they've reached out to Calla regarding Newbank and doing something, and there were beef there. Do you feel that Eddie's got a bit of a brass neck on him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, mean the Canelo situation right? you know the Canelo situation let me start with this one he, he's more or less just acting as the agent for the minute because he's mm-hmm. with that zone but Eddie's putting things out like he's the sole promoter isn't he yeah well he is for two fights yeah <laughs> Oh, but, right, right, right. Well, aren't, aren't they the promoters as well, though? Is, aren't they... I mean, of course they are, right? Did, do you think um, Tom Brown that promotes PBC events, do you think he's the promoter for PBC fighters? Like, you know, Eddie's a bit like Tom Brown on PBC where he puts it. It's like when Mayweather came back, right? He might have been a Tom Brown promoted event against Conor McGregor, but Mayweather was actually the promoter. It was Mayweather Promotions and PBC. You know, Al Heyman's behind the scenes. It's not somebody needs to have the license, right? It's like Richard Poxton when he promoted Chris Eubank Jr. on the PBC on the on the UK. It was PBC just because he had a license, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that was when Senior called him. Uh, what did he call him? Poxton. Senior didn't even know the guy's name. Chris Eubank called him Pop. Popton or something. Yeah, he doesn't even know the guy's name. I mean, it doesn't matter who promotes Canelo. Somebody that has a license. Mm. Yeah, who can put together like, the undercard. It's just like a, any local promoter around here just lending the license out, basically. That's all Eddie's doing. He's oaring himself to try and show Canelo that he's the man. Well, what, what he's doing for me is he's renting that zone money, right? The zone. They had a certain amount of budget that went to Matchroom and certain amount that went to Golden Boy and certain amount that went to Canelo. With this deal coming off, they don't have to, they're not committed as much to paying Canelo. No. And the Canelo fights, 
used to have golden car, uh, golden boy undercards. By Eddie promoting these events, he helps his own to get more subscribers, but also he helps Eddie to get a bigger slice of that the zone pie and that's the end game make sure you spend you know spend as much of that the zone money as possible and get as big of a pie as possible to take away from golden boy because every time canelo fights somewhere else that's one less fight of his career and that's again a big slice of the zone money that could have been spent on a canelo show and as the promoter eddie hearn wants to make sure that's spent on the zone and he puts together the events and he gets a slice of the pie yeah do you feel that Oscar De La Hoya has been outmaneuvered by Eddie? Because Eddie's gone there and he would, at first, he would, do you remember when Eddie first had a meeting with Al Eamon and they were all excited and they made him wait outside office and blah, blah, blah. And then he had to go in and see Al Eamon. Eddie's kind of like tiptoed in and then he's made his own moves, hasn't he? A bit sneakily because one minute they're hugging and kissing him and De La Hoya and the Friends to the end, you know, like Chucky. Yeah. And, and then <laughs> the next minute, he's shafting him with Canelo, isn't he? You think Eddie's uh, a bit of a reptile? I mean, I, that's boxing, isn't he? I mean, everybody's <laughs> friends until they're not friends, right? Look at uh, Bob Arum and Frank War Warren. Uh, that's going to end in tears at some point. Um, you know, Don King and Barry Hearn, and all these guys, you know, it's, it's just a game. But I think... De La Hoya's let himself down here. You know, De La Hoya's not been present at his fighters' shows. He's fallen out with Canelo. He's fallen out with Ryan Garcia. He did that behind-the-back deal to get himself a deal with the zone in exchange for Canelo. You know, he fell out with Canelo spectacularly, ended up in court. But what we figured out afterwards was that the issue wasn't with the zone and Canelo. The issue was with his own golden boy rather than Canelo and the, and the network. So I think Oscar's really dug his own grave and Eddie's just capitalised on that. But as a businessman, he can't really say you need to be loyal to a competitor in any ways. I mean, he's just found the avenue, but he's making the most of it as he can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, exciting times ahead. Sparkling. Added spice. <laughs> <laughs> Rough, tough, rugged. This is why we love this sport so much, Johnny. And we have left off for Canelo. Oh, I was just about to say, and we have lift off. We've, it's good to be back with the Blue Ribbon Division, Matt. We've got <laughs> Dylan White and Povetkin, and Dylan White's dominating. Oh, no, he's knocked him out. <laughs> He's on shaky legs, Adam. So, all right then. Uh, Fury and Big Doss of Femi. Is it going to happen or are they just... Is it a pattern, this? Because I went through a lot of stuff last night in early hours because I couldn't sleep. I had this dream that Dennis was trying to get into my house with Richard Towers to do me in. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Towers there with iron, <laughs> just about to boil me chest. <laughs> Dennis, they like that. Oh, I told you I'm smarter than the average bear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like that. I'm in a haze of Oh, uh, but we like Richard. Richard's a good guy. Yeah. I must have had some good green last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I, I, I decided to, after I woke up in a cold sweat, I got my pad out, I jotted a few things down, went online. And I've noticed that. You know the Manny Pacquiao, Manny Pacquiao Mayweather, when the chat started, they, they let it overkill, didn't they? But I was looking at the patterns, how they kept the fans hooked. And I'm seeing a similar pattern here, and I have I've done for a while now. It's now got to fever pitch now because they've shot the mouse off that much that I think they're going to have to say it's, it's going to happen, isn't it? And then it's that there might be an injury or something. I, look, I just think that we don't get this with MMA, do we? Dana White don't perform like this, does he? They just say, look, it's on or in on it. Well, he's the manager and the promoter and the person that pays the person. So it's uh, it's a bit different, isn't it? Because he runs a monopoly, right? Yeah. But I just think that... Uh, I just I just think they're just paying us lip service at the moment because they're not going to risk this with no fans and 
it, I think it'd be in bad taste to take this fight away from Britain. I mean, come on. I mean, all this well, chat, they've been chatting for years and then they go and take it abroad. Well, all right, think about this, uh, Ross. Who are they? So, I was just looking, June the 11th, last year, Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury agreed to two-fight deal. Eddie Hearn, this is in the BBC. Is that June the 11th? Yeah. Who are so they... We're seven who are they trying, on then, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Who are they trying to sell this to? Is it the boxing fans or the casuals? I don't know, but I'm 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 looking at these analytics and the casuals that they, they were they weren't really up on Joshua, were they? After he did that Black Lives Matter thing, yeah. And I think I think what they're doing is look, they're trying to keep people interested. The casuals, it doesn't matter if us hardcores understand that the fight isn't near happening. You know, there's legal suits uh, between. Shelly Finkel and Wilder versus Fury. There's TV, there's TV issues. There's logistical issues. How you make it work from a pandemic point of view with our crowds, all this stuff. What they're really trying to do is to keep Joshua and Fury's names there and keep fans interested and coming up with excuses why it's not going to happen. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to happen for next, at least next 12, 18 months. At 18 the very least. Months, yeah. If it happens at all. Yeah, I mean, look, there's mandatories are going to come. Is Joshua going to vacate a belt? Probably not. You know, road to undisputed. There's going to, all these mandatories are going to start creeping up. Are they going to, you know, there was an article, I think it was in Belly's favorite newspaper, The Sun, about uh, Usyk, <laughs> about Usyk, uh, yeah, Usyk uh, vacating, you know, leaving Matchroom if he doesn't get the title shot. You know, there's too much money to be made still from both guys fighting mandatories. There's too many pay-per-views to be made from these lesser opponents that you make the fight now because that, you know, once you make that fight and it's a two-fight deal, you know, you end up losing interest in one of the guys. Like, pay-per-view one, unless it's spectacular, Fury against uh, Joshua, unless it's a controversial win or, you know, something happens, but like Wilder against Fury people lose interest. So once you make that fight, Eddie Hearn and Matt Schroom are putting all of their eggs in the Joshua basket. So that's when Eddie wants to exit or he has another star coming up when he needs to make that move. Tyson Fury, I mean, look, how interested is he in boxing still? I'm not sure. I mean, look, he's gone up, he's gone to the top of the mountain. He's beaten Klitschko. He's beaten Wilder. What's left for him to achieve? To beat Joshua? But in the meanwhile, he can make millions. He can become a celebrity. I mean, his wife's always on Loose Women. He's doing his own things. I don't think Fury's too fussed about boxing anymore. I don't. He's been out at ring a year right now, hasn't he? Well, in two weeks, he's been out a, re- a year, Tyson. In that year... If you remember last March, a month after he beat Wilder, I said, this is going to get tied up in legal mess. It reminded me of the Holyfield, Lennox Lewis, after that. Mm. It uh, it was something around about then about legal stuff and and that that kind of thing. Uh, Lennox Lewis, when he got knocked out first time, that were legal disputes. And and at this level where there's that much money, there's too many strong personalities around that, that, that... all wanting to eat off the same plate, isn't there? And, and, and it, I always think that there's it's an old saying that Dennis used to say to me, too many cooks spoil the broth. And I think that there's too many chefs in the kitchen at the moment. And yeah. everybody's jostling for their little piece of the pie. And I just think, it, I see it all blowing up in the faces. The Manny Pacquiao one was the greatest con to ever con the con. 4.4 million buys. And yet... I can explain it. It was a crap fight. They were both past it, weren't they? Yeah, and particularly Manny was, it looked like he was injured. It wasn't the same thing. But remember, the hype gets you the week before the hype really gets you, and you start believing that these guys are back in their prime. But, you know, is it going to do more buys now than in 18 months? I don't think so. It's going to do the same amount or more in 18 months. So why do the fight now? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what to make of it all, but like I said, they've shot the mouse off that much that if it doesn't happen this year, 
Right? The only way out of it is an injury. Because everything else will be blamed on promoters and politics, won't it? Oh, you can blame the pandemic. You can say you want to have it in Britain and we need we need oh, everybody to be able to go to events. And oh, they've got a ready-made excuse then, haven't they? Exactly, exactly. All right, then, moving on. Uh, Fearon's spat with Tunde Ajayi. Spirit. Fearon. Oh, well, we covered that already. Oh, we covered that already. Sorry, I've got short term memory loss, haven't I? Oh, it's just about oh, to say that, mate. Somebody asked me uh, what I take for it because they reckon they've got it. Let me just uh, get it out. The briefcase. Yeah, the briefcase. <laughs> the briefcase. <laughs> Is that where all the uh, secrets or boxes are buried? It's where the uh, passports are and the uh, the getaway, the getaway money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the call, somebody asked me, Colin, if you're genuine, I hope you are, Colin, because I don't believe any emails that I get until I speak to them on Zoom. I just take it as a pinch of salt, although I, I, most of them are genuine, but a lot aren't, and they spoil it for the rest. But they're uh, Invicta D3, they're called. They don't seem to be doing job though, do they, Rico? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we spoke about the fear one. Let me just have a look what the other one were. Uh, what fighters that match them would you say are not getting the chances at the moment? They seem to be forgotten about. Oh, we have we have Kelly Avanesian again announced, right? Yeah. Uh, Warrington Lara, which is, I'm sure we'll come to that. Um, and we have White against Povetkin, Akoli Golovaki. So I think what Matchroom at the moment, what they're doing is a lot of the fights and events are anchored around these guys like White, uh, Joshua to an extent, and who they have. Then they're quite heavily pushing Connor Ben. Okay. Um, so I think it leaves away these guys that are on the cusp of a world title shot, whether that's Beefy Smith's. Um, actually, a lot of Gallagher fighters, to be honest. So you've got Beefy Smith, Callum Johnson. And to the life of me, I just can't understand why. Like, Shannon Courtney against Rachel Ball, too. Not particularly interested in that fight. I'd rather see Natasha Jonas, Terry Harper, too. That was a better fight. Natasha Jonas has done good job to her profile over this lockdown. You know, very good commentator, great boxing insight, just seems like a genuinely lovely lady. Um, you know, give her a shot. Don't push Shannon Courtney. Um, this whole Connor Ben thing, you know, are they trying to fast track Connor Ben so that he can fight against Josh Kelly, win or lose? I don't think Josh Kelly is going to win. Um, Lawrence Acoli, so it's a lot of rescheduling, isn't it? It's good to see uh, Savannah Marshall fight again uh, against TBC. Um, but it's the guys that are cheaper and the guys that are pushed by Joshua and White. What's what they're doing? Is, is, what they do, dogs, they tend to burrow, don't they, into a position. I watched yeah. a program about it on Google. Wolves do it, don't they? And it felt as though yeah. he's happy now. Look. <laughs> he needs an we've got Chris. We've got Chris Billum smith Dion Juma as well, which is a, another rescheduled fight. So he seemed to be pushing these Olympians and these guys that are sort of cheaper and also in earlier stage of their career and they've got forgotten all these guys like Callum Smith, Beefy Smith, uh, not Callum Smith, Beefy Smith, um, Callum Johnson, Marcus Morrison, another guy that won in Italy. Why isn't the Callum B Smith side? Getting... Yeah, why isn't Callum Smith getting a title shot? I mean, beat Shawnee Monaghan. You mean... Yeah, I know Callum Smith. Callum John sorry, Callum, Callum, Callum Johnson. Callum yeah, Johnson. Yeah. Too many Callums. Uh, Callum Johnson. You know, he should be getting a title shot. He should be getting a big card. He's a, he's got an exciting style. I'd rather watch that than Joe Cordina against yet another guy that he's gonna beat in on points that British fringe European level. Now, I'm going to throw a curveball at you here, Rico, right? And this is something that 
a lot of people have, well, a few people have, have asked me in emails, but I've seen it spoke about in forums and seen some discussions now. Do you think that Eddie, right, and Sky think that Joe Gallagher became too powerful at one point because he had, he would ring magazine trainer at year and he, he was churning out champion after champion after champion, wasn't he, at one point, all the way through mm -hmm. the levels, wasn't he? Do you feel that now, the, the, do you feel now that they're trying to back him into a corner so his fighters say, we're not getting our chances because we were you, Joe. So then fighters then leave and go to Sims, McCracken or McCracken's brother or Colwell, Dominic Ingle. What? What? I don't know. What? What do you do? You think that? You think that Joe's being put in a bit of a tight spot here, and you think the fighters' patience in the end will say, "Look, Joe, we, we want to move on." And I don't. I don't know. What do you think? Or do you think his stable's pretty tight? Because it looks pretty tight, doesn't it? They look. They all look a tight knit group, don't they? Yeah, I think the stable's tight, but I can see where that sort of idea has come from. And I think part of it is as well, if you look at who's filling these cards, a lot of them are managed by the same people. A lot of these managers uh, that look after these fights are just happy to take anything because they get they cut, right? Joe's made a good amount of money. He's looked after his fighters. Um, also, he's pushed for his fighters. A lot of these guys down the cards, they managers are just there to churn these kids out, get them into as many fights as possible so they get their cut. I mean, how many lockdown fights has Ted Cheeseman had? Not a few, hasn't he, Ted? Yeah, exactly. And now he's fighting against uh, JJ Metcalf. He's a so, super fighter, though, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. So we, have, so we have this sort of situation where the managers are willing to accept... It's like a volume game for them, right? If I can get six of my kids on these cards and I can take my 20%, it's better the 20% of these lower purses rather than trying to get your fighters to get what they owe than, you know, get what they paid. Do you feel that uh, if we get to, say, April, right, and these same people that we're on about, you know, Tasha Jonas, Callum Johnson, Beefy Swift, Marcus Morrison, they've not had the slot. And then... Do you feel that then Joe can say, what's going on here to the powers that be? I, I think he could say that already, but I don't know what the contracts are with these fighters and promoters, but, you know, there's other options. Eddie Hearn's not the only game in town, but also I think fans are getting increasingly frustrated looking at some of these cards and seeing these big names missing because... I know there's a pandemic. I know we don't have fans and stuff. But at the end of the day, our subscription fees haven't gone down. I mean, frankly, the fact the economics of boxing, as a fan, I shouldn't really care about what they can make. It's about making the best events. And it's about mm -hmm. taking that short-term hit as a promoter if you want to put on a good product. Because boxing's, boxing has lost the law of ground uh, to the UFC during this pandemic. And the best events we've got have been fights which have been from the US, the zone fights, frankly. So they've been, you know, Campbell against Garcia was a good fight on paper uh, and turned out to be a good fight anyways. Callum Smith against Canelo. These are fights that are made in the US because the zone's fronting it up and putting the money where Sky, I haven't seen put up the same money and emphasis. They can hide behind the pandemic, but, you know, they just need to get on with it. You know, fans want to see good fights. Can't serve a substandard product. Don't serve you at all. I mean, I've got a theory on that, right? And it's backed up by statistics. Let's look at an, an average Eddie Earn card. You'd have to have a will title on there, but it doesn't always happen. Chief support, you know, your cheeseman types, and then and then and then like an average going to the bottom, say a six or seven card fight. Yeah. Now what you've got is you've got the big names missing. And they're sort of patching up the dates to get the fighters out, aren't they? Struggling to fill the dates with fighters that are willing to take the pay cuts. Now, it seems to me that certain smart promoters and managers, when Eddie rings, and they just say yes, please, and they go running to him. Yes, okay, Eddie, yeah, well, we're, we're, yes, we'll do it. You, do you feel like that your old stage people who were managers and trainers, they're like, well, no, we're not fighting for that. That's wrong. 
because your money's not coming down. So why should our money come down? So Eddie's still making a profit on the shows. He's just paying people a lot less and working with people that will do it on the cheap. Do you feel that that's going on? 100%. So let's look at this um, Kelly against Avanisian card. So that's the main event. Then you've got Florian Marku against Marlon Charlton. That's a cheap fight. Sam Jones will accept why I was offered him Florian Marku after last performance. Violin Charlton's cheap. Anthony Fowler against Jorge Fotera. Never heard of Jorge Fotera. I know he's ranked, but, you know, he's not going to be an expensive guy. The guy has two losses, three, one draw in 21 fights. Fowler's cheap. That's a Dave. He's not. Is he Dave Conwell or is he uh, Shane McGuigan? I can't Shane remember. Shane McGuigan. Shane McGuigan, right? Johnny Fisher, debutant. Fair enough. Mark Tibbs. That, yeah, fair enough. He's making his debut. Amy Timlin, again, four fights, female fighters, so the purses are a lot lower. So you look at that card, it's made on the cheap, right? Mm. Kelly Avanesian, I think the whole purses for that have been put down loads because of all the cancellations. And, you know, you can say to Josh Kelly that look at all the costs that has gone into promoting these three previous events. Good fight, that, you know. That is a good fight. That's a good fight. But anything underneath that, you've got British-level fight, Florian Marco against Ryland Charlton, area-level, I'd say. Probably area-level, to be honest. Fowler against a foreign fighter, cheap foreign fighter. Fowler, you don't pay much. Johnny Fisher making a debut. Amy Tumlin. If we're talking about the matchroom side of the card... Kelly, Marku, Fowler, Fisher, Amy Timlin. How much is the purse for that, maybe? Not even 100 grand, I'd say. Well, you've got 150 coming in from Sky Straight Away TV money. Then you've got all sponsors throwing into the pot. You could have technically about 250 in, 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 in on the night. So it's how about we get rid of Amy Timlin and we put Callum Johnson in there against... Someone half decent but, and getting back, you know, getting back onto that rebuilding job. We had this chat a long time ago, right? and, and and I think I've mentioned it to people, but people get confused. So let me just spell it out to the people who are confused. A promoter gets the TV money, and he tries to keep that TV money because he has that up front in his pocket. Am I right, Rico? He tries right. to keep that as 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 his, as his profit on the night, if it's an on pay per view. The rest of the show is made up of sponsorship and TV and ticket money, isn't it? Right? We all know that, don't we? Sponsorship can be toe the rose, ring aprons, boarding, uh, anything, signs around the ring, TV adverts. So that's made up of sponsorship, right? The promoter, I can explain it. The promoter will try and sell the show to death. And that's what Eddie Earn does. So to sell the show to death, you need... YouTubers that hang out the back of you. You need media guys who, who you get on with and who you look after. And yeah, I'll get you that drink. Yeah, just do you send a mix. Grill, just put it on my tab. That's how it look, get looks after. Look, that's, how, that's how you look after these people. So you're selling that show to death to get as much tickets. You'll shake everybody's hand on the night and they'll all say, oh, that promote was great. You did selfies with his blah de blah. But you'll still work towards keeping all that money, that TV money for themselves now. They haven't got the ticket money now, have they? Well, no, they've got the no. Sponsor. But the venue is cheaper, right? The yeah, venue, the venue is, it doesn't cheaper. matter anymore. You don't have to book the O2 because you're not selling tickets. You can do from a studio, or you know, the yeah. venue's a lot cheaper. You sell, you sell, you sell. You haven't got your tickets, so you're thinking, well, we can still sell the show to death. What we can do is get the fighters to take a little bit less money to make up for the tickets that we've not sold. But he's still juggling it, but I bet you any money, he's hardly backing into that TV money. I'm telling you, I know how it used to work. I've been through this. I've seen paperwork, how it works, going back in the day. Going back yeah. in the day, how it works. I've seen it in with my own eyeballs. I'm like, whoa. So this is how they do it. It's like, right, I hope now. And it's good, it's good how he's done it. But when, he, when they are selling tickets, what he'll do, Eddie, he'll come. Loads of famous people now, and easy ones. All that shower from Towie, in it because they've all got yeah. loads of followers, aren't they? We'll comp all them and then let them do the business on Twitter. 
give them a VIP, but they've got to push it on the Twitters and the social medias. That's how he's been able to do it. And the rest of it, he's got a bit of front, hasn't he? Although, when it comes down to it, he ain't really got no arsehole. And we know about a few stories, don't they, where he's gone. 100%. But he's got a bit of front, surrounded by security. He's a front man. He's a good salesman. Let me tell you this. And this is where I do admire Eddie Earn. He's a hard worker. My dad always used to say, hard work's what's gonna, what will get you in life, get you your goals. The hard workers, but... It's become now pure greed. Be quiet. Yeah. Okay. It's become, let me just let him out because he'll just do it. Come on then, scoot. Come on, Rocky, scoot. I'm filming. He'll be at the door in about five minutes. He's a bit clingy around <laughs> me, isn't he? <laughs> That's jealous. I'd, yeah, I'd, um, yeah, I'd add to that actually with the, how the TV stuff works. So, the advertising sold by the TV. So the TV makes their money by selling the advertising. So that's the yeah. ads in between. And that's the ads. So Maxi Muscle or whatever it is. <clears throat> but then also the TV will cover the production of the show. Um, so the TV is effectively selling its airtime in exchange for advertising, yeah. where that makes it money. So everybody makes the money, but ultimately the boxes take the hit. Um, and I'd say increasingly... <coughs> you know, Matchroom will do all sorts of sponsorships. So we saw Wingstop, which is like a chicken wings place around here. They were doing, you know, they didn't really have adverts out there, you know, at the venue, but they were doing a lot around social media. They're giving free food out. So they would pay. So they're coming up with these new ways to make money on the shows. And some of that's how they do social media stuff. So you remember after all these fights, like all these guys are ordering five guys you know, five guys burgers. So you had Chisora ordering loads and then giving, um, you know, giving Usyk and his team some. But now they figured that actually, you know what, we'll get sponsored from Wingstop. They'll give all these chicken wings and all this other food for fighters and people afterwards uh, and sell some food there. And then Matchroom will now make money off that. So, they'll, so they've come up with good ways to monetize every aspect of the show. So who's yeah. selling the food, you know, social media, everything else. So... I think, yeah, they've, they've been groundbreaking in British boxing in that way. Yeah. But in the effort to make the money and to keep that promoter money in these times, what has suffered is the product, which is the quality of fights we have on cards. And increasingly, as it becomes harder to sell boxing events, we're seeing that it's not anymore about making the best fights. It's about making the fights the fit so they work backwards. So what they'll do is they'll say, this is the budget. This is how much we'll make a sponsorship. This is how much we'll make of the TV money that we want to keep. This is how much we'll make of ticket sales. What fights can we fit into this budget for this event? And they'll start from that angle rather than saying, we'll make good fights and then we'll see if we can sell more tickets or you know if we can get sponsorship or back of the fights. And you also said the media is an important aspect because the media is a good sort of signal post when Gareth A. Davies writes about it in the Telegraph when these YouTubers are doing they stuff, they can say to the sponsors, look how many people are viewing these videos. Look how many people read the Telegraph. Look, it's a big event. And some of these sponsors aren't boxing people, right? And they'll go, wow, that must be a good fight. And this guy's fighting for WBC International tonight and two undefeated fighters. And that's how it really works. I mean, this is how I look at it, right? Where, where I have an argument with it is this, is the quality of control, because mm -hmm. once that show's done and completed with Matchmaker and everything's all signed off, they then go to Ed Robinson and Bean, and they say, right, Bean and Ed Robbo, here you go. They'll go, yeah, that's a good fight, that's a good fight, that's, no, that's not a good fight, no, no, yes, yes, no, no. What Eddie will do then... He knows that to make, put better fights on to the ones that have been refused, he's at breaking point now with the numbers because he's a numbers guy. He's, he, Eddie's now thinking, I want to put my promoters that on. I've now got to step into the, one, into the TV money, which is his, because they're used to having that all the time, and mm -hmm. other monies, but they'll be just having TV money at the moment. He's got to break into that 150 man, to subsidise a couple of other fights, and he won't want to do that. So they'll keep shuffling the pack till Sky say, yeah, go on, then it's passable, but it's got to be better next time. But that's been going on for far too long now, hasn't it? 
Yeah, the quality has dropped incrementally. Uh, oh, it's not been like a, it's not been a big drop, right? It's not been like one of like this pandemic dropped everything loads. What's happened is incrementally, and actually the pandemic has created this thing where we can drop it by quite a bit to say we don't. Oh, pandemic money. Rico, it dropped though, won't it? But what I'm, what I'm saying is it, yeah, it has dropped, but now it's dropped even more. Yeah. And what it means is that when we come out of this pandemic, the only thing they have to do is increase the fights a bit better and they get to keep more of the gate money. Yeah. Uh, whereas my problem with Sky has been that when you look at Fox, uh, Showtime, you know, somewhat guys like Steven Espinosa and others, they will know what good fights are and they'll push back to Heyman and co. And they'll say, we're not happy with this fight. We don't want this on the televised undercard. And they've been more stringent with that process. Whereas with Sky, they just seem to be happy to be in bed with Matchroom. It they goes back to quality out. control, Rico, doesn't it? They've got an exclusive deal with Matchroom Sky. So how is there going to be any quality control? Because you've got a conflict of interest. You've got... Bean, Bean's the commentator, and he's the he's the man that's signing off on the fights. We had Robinson, uh, and he's and he's he's in with he's in mates with fighters. They're all hanging out back of each other, and fighters are getting pundit jobs of him. We've got Bellew, the management guy. He's putting his fighters on Sky. So, the, and, but yeah, he's a pundit as well, and, and a manager, and he's putting fighters on there. It's all a cesspit and a cult, and I've got a major problem with it because I see major problems down the line for what's going on here. Massive, massive ramifications for boxing, mate. Yeah, I, I agree. And if you look at the best boxing operation we've had in the last 30 years, that was probably HBO at its peak. Um, you know, you had guys like Larry Merchant, you had Lou DeBella there on the boxing side, head of boxing. Um, you had all these other guys, what's it called, Seth, whatever his name was, Seth Greenberg or yes, all these Seth guys. Yeah, wrong yeah, all of, yeah, all of these guys were boxing guys, true and true, and they were there to make sure HBO got the best product, and they were very pushy on that, whereas with Sky, Sky and Matchroom have basically become the same entity in many ways, the Sky yeah. boxing lot and Matchroom. So they... They are pushing Matchroom as much as they push in Sky. But as you said, the problem is we're not getting the best fight. So what you really need is somebody should be there at Sky and say, hey, Callum Johnson hasn't fought for a while. Why don't we get him on the card? We really want Callum Johnson because we want to build this guy. We want to back him up. But now Eddie's sort of controlling the fighters that are being pushed and he's not being controlled by the network who puts the money up. They're all the same entity, Sky and Matchroom. Like it's, they act in the same way. Whereas at least I can say on BT, it seems a bit more separate that Frank Warren, all those mates there running the boxing stuff, but BT seem to be not as close to all the stuff. Like you don't see many BT people being interviewed on. Why IFL am I turning on my telly in the morning and I've got Bean on every channel doing interviews? You don't get the BT main guy doing that, do you? No, I mean, look, you, you didn't have you didn't have Lou DiBella when he was at HBO doing every every single interview um, no. because they behind the scenes and they making sure the product is the best. Yeah, but Bean's a, Bean's a commentator. He's a behind the scenes man at Sky making all the decisions for his team. His team. Listen, on your laptop in Beanie. Uh, you, you've got you've got all that going on. It's a conflict of interest. So. When they sit down, it, listen, humans are creatures of habit. It's just like drug dealing or smuggling cigarettes. You sit down and where there's money involved and you say, look, this product's not very good for this show. And they'll go, yeah, but come on, Adam, like, we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out on next one and give them a bumper one. We'll do a Christmas bonanza or whatever shit they're going to speak. And the, the people at Sky are the problem. It's no good people emailing Eddie Earn. People need to email Sky Sports complaints. Complain to Sky Sports about the product. It's no good me sh uh, sh ranting and raving, screaming and shouting on here because we're only a small voice. The, the fans have got to do it themselves and they've got to tell other fans. So, look, this is not right. What, yeah. I mean, if we sit a boxing fan in a, in a, in a, in a pub, sit down and say, mm. right, are you happy with the fights that are on Sky at the moment? How many people are going to say yes? They're not. They're going to say, no, we're not happy. 2012, 
Frotch Boote, non pay per view, 2020. Oh, Ted Cheeseman, Eggington. Do you see a picture here? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Do you know what I mean? Skid Row. It's on Skid Row. The product's watered down. It's like buying a kilo of Charlie and you're like, you know, the, the blue the blue the sparkly stuff when it's glistening in bag and you're like... <sighs> <sighs> and then, you know, once it's been passed down the line, you're like, I'm not getting out of this. I'm, I've just had something to eat. It's not doing nothing for me. And you're looking in your underpants and you're like, oh, something's not happening here. You know what I mean? You see where I'm coming from? That's what's happening. The product's been jumped all over, mate. Do you remember when the next gen shows were announced, right? And they were meant to be the fights that, de- you know, the kind of concept that develops these young fighters. Uh, and it was meant to be like a Friday night lighter touch. Now, when you look at a lot of these cards, they all next gen cards, aren't they? Yeah. All of these cards are just next gen. Fucking next gen. Do me a favor with this next gen. Chris Eubank. Running around with next gen sweaters on. He's 32 next birthday. <laughs> you couldn't make it up next gen. It, it's like it's like when they put uh, Jamie McDonald on next gen. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you, in his 30s? All right then. Uh, Josh Warrington, Kid Galahad, uh, IBF, WBO, Heyman talk for, for Kid Galahad. Where do you see that cesspit ending up? Because obviously Josh is vacating, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, look, with the whole Josh thing... Bellew's in I, the mix as well, anyway. Jazzy Dickens. Of course it is. Um, yeah, I, I think with the whole Josh thing, for me, it's good to... I understand that, obviously, vacating titles isn't great, but I think it's good to see fighters say to these governing bodies... I'm not going to pay the sanctioning fees if they're going to take a hit. Um, if people want to move to the idea that, well, the best fight the best, so that's a good sign. Um, but again, the question I have is, when Warrington was signed from Bank Warren to come to Matchroom, what has Matchroom done for him? Yeah. And it's happened with Billy Joe Saunders. They haven't delivered. It's happened with Beefy Smith. Yeah. Matchroom hasn't delivered. It's happened with so many guys. They all leave Frank to join uh, Matchroom. And the next thing you know, they vacate in titles. They gain these lesser fights. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it just seems like a car crash. And why I think it's, what, what I think they're doing is they basically, if they let Kid Galahad fight against Gaza Dickens, they can do one main event uh, with that. And then they can start rolling out more Kid Galahad world title defense events. And on the other hand, they can do Josh Warrington um, fight against somebody for not about maybe on a top rank or PVC show. And they can do that as another main event. So it's all sort of like the belts are the reason why they can run main events. So it's better that more people have the belts or have held the belt so you can do more main events. I kind of, if I completely get Josh Warrington's point about vacating for, you know. $50,000, the bid. So he gets thirty-seven five. How much is $37,500, Rico, in, in pounds sterling? Uh, 37500 That's probably like thirty-two grand. Thirty-two grand. So you do a 13-week camp. So he's got trainer to pay, manager, sparring partners, tax. Eddie Earns cut or whether it's promoter on the evening who's won the purse. So there's all that to pay out that. It, it's, there's no left, is there? So what would Galahad have had out 12 and a half grand after Dominic Ingalls took a big bite out of him? He'd have had no, he'd, he'd have been owing money. Do you see where I'm coming from? Yeah. Do you feel that he were put into a situation, Warrington, where they wanted him to vacate? So that's why only one purse bid went out. Probably, yeah. They and probably another, just looked. One. They lowballed. They probably just lowballed him. That's the thing. All right then. Do you do you remember Gary Shaw winning that fifty thousand dollar purse when nobody else bid on the Peterson fight with somebody else? Do you remember it? Gary Shaw. Yeah, Gary Shaw won a fifty thousand dollar bid. Point I want to make is everybody were like, "Wow, we missed that one" because nobody fancied the fight. I think it were 
Peterson against somebody else. I forget now. Some some hardcores will probably tell me in an email. But point I want to make is that why didn't Eddie Earn? He's going out to bat for Galahad and Warrington. Why didn't he put a purse bid in? He's got billions, and he billion dollar Eddie. World title fight, a rematch, and there's intense beef or corn beef or whatever you want to call it. Laughing roasted beef. roasted beef, roast pork. <laughs> <laughs> Apple sauce and me, they don't spit with an apple in my mouth after John Fury gets me. <laughs> Big John, come see me. No, point I want to make is that I thought it were all handled a bit poor and there were all this back back and forth on social media. And I, you've got a, a IFL Boxing Social doing one interview, then they're ringing other guy up for his version. And look, this is how I look at it, right? And I said it last night in, in a video. Did you see that video, Rico? Yes. I said, basically, Kid Gallard don't, he can't draw flies to a turd. That's his style. It's horrible. He's only won vacant belts. TV don't want him. That's the bottom line. TV don't want him. Sky didn't want him. They show what they think about him because they didn't even match him when they didn't even bid for him. And he's their fighter. So if you're not going to go out on a limb for your fighter, what's all that about? And another thing as well, and people keep forgetting about this, Matchroom don't even enter the purse bids. And if they do, they never win them. Tell me the last purse bid Matchroom ever won. You can't, can um, you? No. I think there was one relatively recently because Eddie made a big point of it on um, IFL or somewhere. Fucking at what off an English title. Listen, something like Chris that. Eubank, when he come to end, his last two fights, we, uh, we, we Matchroom... He, he, they never even want purse bids for them, mate. You know what I mean? Frank Warren won them bids. Do you know what I mean? And put Collins in with them, beat him. Eubank's only defeats were against Frank Warren fighters. You know what, don't you? Carl yeah. Thompson, twice. Collins, twice. Carl Zaggy, right? They were all with Frank Warren. Barry Earn, he didn't want to put Eubank near any danger. But when it come to end of his career... He didn't want to put his money up, his little pile that he'd made off the back of Chris Eubank. Oh, no, we'll let Frank Warren win purse bids and we'll go fight away from home in Ireland. Well, you're fighting away from home. When it comes down to cards, you, you, you'll you find wanting, aren't you, in Ireland against Collins, a big draw. You yeah. see where I'm coming from? So it's all about money, but I think Barry Hearn showed his true colours then with Chris Eubank, senior, and I think they'll show the true colours with Joshua when the shit hits the fan. You will see, because at the, at the end of the day, it's like trading horses. It's like SYPS, isn't it? They've got 17 racehorses. I don't know. Not about horse racing, by the way. They've got 17 racehorses. They win horses, they sell horses. So they win racers and they sell horses. It's a business, isn't it? You might get attached to us, going to see it every morning at your stables, but once that offer comes in, that horse is going. And that's just like yeah. boxers, isn't it? You yeah, know what I mean, I, yeah, I, I completely agree. And the thing about Josh Warrington is that he doesn't really need the belt to reach his goals, does he? No. Like, why, why keep hanging around? It's probably easier to make the Kanzu fight, the Russell Junior fight, without the belt. It makes no difference, does it? It might mean that he's hampered in the negotiations because he's a challenger. Uh, but it probably means it's easier for him to go onto other platforms. Sky won't be as fast. Who wants uh, to see Galahad Warrington? Do you want to see it? No, not particularly. I don't want to I see mean, it. I mean, look, I had Galahad winning the first fight, but I still yeah. don't want to see. I had Josh winning by two rounds. Thought he I was, was live betting throughout the fight to put money on Galahad because I thought he was so up, but because the odds were long, but obviously the bookmakers saw something I didn't. But either way, it was a close fight, but it wasn't an entertaining fight. Josh Warrington has a very ex uh, exciting style. I'd love to see him face against Kanzu, but is that a fight that Matchroom are willing to put on their show, as we've been talking about in these times? It's not going to be a pay-per-view, but it's not going to be a cheap fight either. Josh Warrington fighting on a, another promoter's card against Kanzu or against Gary Russell Jr. on Fox or Showtime. I think it sort of makes sense. And as I said earlier, Fox is vacating titles. I've got no problems with that because less to the governing bodies and, you know, less all of this nonsense of fighting mandatories that aren't there. I have no problems with mandatories, but I have a problem when the mandatories that get there are pretty average at best. 
You see, you know, that with Gallagher, right? Nobody's saying that he's not a well-schooled fighter, are they? Yeah, nobody's saying but, that. But what we're saying is we, the, the fans haven't talked to him, have they? They don't take to that style and how he is outside the ring. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I agree. He's not he's not the most popular fighter, at least on Twitter, but that's my sample size. But You think that's yeah, why yeah. Sky and Macho didn't put the purse bid in? I just think, personally, I think they can get the deal done. I mean, look, it's Jazza Dickens, Tony Bellew. I think MTK has some involvement with Jazza Dickens as well. You can Bellew's his one. manager. Oh, yes, you're right. But he went on the golden contract, didn't he? But, yeah, so they can make a deal that doesn't reveal the numbers or the purses, which is probably advantageous with how putting a purse put in. It's going to be, you know, that's what they're just going to do. That right. fight's going to happen. Go on, sorry. That fight's going to happen, but nobody's going to see the purses. And the purses, Galahad's side won't see Dickens's purse and vice versa. And Belly will do a favorable deal. He'll go, go on, Jazza. It's uh, 20 grand, world title. And after this, he can fight against anybody you want. We'll make the Josh Warrington fight, and Jazza will go, okay. I mean, I'm going to throw a curveball at you now, but what you said there could be right. You know, the, the geezer who's got the WBO belt, Yazza's number one contender for that, isn't he? Yeah. Right? And he he's obviously, it's him and Galahad for IBF now, it's vacant. But I think Yazza gets beat against Galahad. I think uh, he, he's just got too much in his locker for him, the other kid. Yazza would have to make it rough and be dirty like he did with Josh Whale. And he should have had points took off him against Josh Whale. But going back to... Yazza against Galahad, he gets beat. So why don't he fight the WBO guy? Although he won't be a favourite in that fight. But if he lost to that fight, he could always fight Galahad down the line when Galahad's lost his belt, couldn't he? But if he loses to Galahad again, he'll not get a third, will he? Do you see what I'm coming for? He will never get that WBO fight. Yeah. But... People in my promoters that I'm looking at, or managers that I'm looking at it from that perspective. Why don't he go for the WBO? And if he wins that... Well, it'd be an hard fight, but if he did, they could have a unification and both get paid then, couldn't they? Well, Navarrete is a tough guy, right? It, I mean, yeah. he, beat, he beat Isaac Dogbe. He's a, he's a massive guy at the weight. He's tall, um, he's got good reach. His style isn't suited for fighting any of these British guys, even Josh Warrington included. Yeah. He's the guy that you really want to avoid, not because he's the best technical boxer, but just because... There's no point in doing it. Um, and I also think with Josh Warrington, it depends what he wants to do with his career, right? He can make a lot of money fight against Russell Jr. and against Kanzu. Maybe he fights in China against Kanzu. He can make a lot of money fighting as opponents or beating one of them and then facing the other. And that's a good way for him to end his career and cash out. Um, rather than taking these fights, which are not particularly lucrative uh, as a world title holder. What do you think, Rico, about uh, the videos that are coming out every day on social media, the Dave Caldwell sermon and the Gareth Davis sermon, Johnny Nelson, Macklin, Bean, and, and they're working the same old four or five YouTube channels two and a half hours a day. Do you think that these people are told to do that from Sky or they're doing it because they're trying to stay in the circle of trust, or do you think they're doing it for fame, or, or or they like to hear their own voice? What do you think? Because I'm getting a bit fed up with it, Rico. I think I think it's a bit of all of the above. Uh, I think a lot of people have thought that it's very easy to get into this boxing YouTube game because you have a platform um, and they haven't put in the graph. They've just set up their channels and they just want to interview yeah. guys on the yeah. same topics. Nobody wants to give a view one side or the other. I mean, why? I mean, Gareth A. Davis has his own column or he writes his own pieces for Telegraph. There's not much boxing going on. I think he just wants to get his YouTube money. You but think you see the him, mate? Did you see Pardon? that thing with that girl, that Australian? Yeah, yeah, Ebony Bridges or whatever her name is. Well, what did you think to that? What do you think that was seedy? That it looked, it looked a bit. Uh... I just would have cut it out myself. If Adam if Smith had had done that, right, they'd be like being back in a van now with Fed. <laughs> <Yeah. operating court. laughs> I, I think there's, I think there's two. So box. So this pandemic has done a few things on boxing podcasts and YouTube. 
A lot of people have stopped doing their podcast because they because the people are to... up on the bullshit. <laughs> Well, there's nothing, there's nothing to, there's nothing to discuss, really, is there? Yeah. Others have started it because they have nothing else to do, and they think they voice warrants um, an opinion. Like Gareth A. Davies interviewing fighters is a direct competitor for IFL, Boxing Social, Second House, Behind the Gloves. I'm not going to watch Gareth A. Davies doing a one-hour sit down. Dave Caldwell will do it to keep himself relevant. Um, I kind of understand why he does it because he does it to be an advert for himself and, you know, get fighters and share his opinions. But, you know, it's, it's much for muchness. I mean, fans have so many hours a day and I can't listen to one person doing four or five interviews on the same topics. That's not facing anybody. You know, what new are they going to tell me? You know, what insights am I going to get? They just yeah. filling the market, right? When you've got, 10 channels interviewing the same handful of people. Like, what they, what's Dave Caldwell going to tell me this week that I didn't hear last week or the week before or the week before? I don't know, but obviously they get it, don't they? You know, you Dave Caldwell's people like that. They seem to get where water goes, don't they? But we wish Dave well, don't we, when he gets to old prison, when Purple Ack is waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> the purple, the purple one. Uh, all right then, Dillian White, he's got a new trainer. What do you think? Has he left Xavier Miller? Somebody's told me he's left Xavier Miller. Let me just get it up on my phone. Harold Knight, is it? Somebody said to me, I don't know if this is true, it might be rubbish, they might be setting me up, but somebody said to me he's got rid of him. Uh, if it's true, uh, that's his fifth trainer, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, look, he's keeping the cost down, isn't he? He's... Um... <laughs> He's keeping I mean, more yeah. people are happy to train Dillian White for more or less nothing. So I, I believe that he's he's just keeping the cost down. Well, um, I, I don't think you know, there's only so much unless you're a guy that's really experienced like uh Mark Tub Mark Tubbs, there's not much you're gonna teach him. And also a lot of these guys are not gonna be they're not gonna be there to tell Dillian, you know, what to do and what to improve. They just happen to be part of the camp. Yeah. And I, I think it's probably not good for his career, but it's his choice at the end of the day if he thinks he can by cutting costs. What happened to his brother, Dean White? Um, uh, wasn't he meant to be training him a bus? <laughs> at least he claimed. Dean White? Yeah. Jeez, what's he going to do? So just looking at this thing, so Harold, the Shadow Knight, who trained Lennox Lewis, apparently, I never heard of him, uh, for professionally, I think he's added to him, uh, he's added him to the team. I'm not sure whether he's got rid of Xavier Miller, but none of these guys are going to be telling Dillian when to go up for runs or, you know, what to do in the corner. It's going to be, he's going to be the Dave Caldwell replacement or, you know, the guy that's another voice in the corner. Because Xavier Miller isn't that experienced. Uh, Xavier Miller's only a babby, isn't he? He were Mark Tibbs' second one. He was supposed to be learning off Mark Tibbs. Yeah, he, he was at the IQ Boxing uh, down in London, uh, who has a few few good trainers have come out of there. But he's yeah, he's relatively inexperienced. It doesn't mean that you're not a good trainer if you're inexperienced, but I'm not sure whether he's whether he's able to run a camp on his own without any help or whether he's actually done his homework sorry about that uh, I can't find it but somebody sent me some it might, it might not be true it might just be no it, there's an article about it I just checked there's actually articles about oh. it Har Harold Knight so Dylan basically is on his fifth trainer then now no this guy's just part of the team uh, yeah he's part of the team I'm not sure whether he's the only guy in the team yeah, I think. Yeah, he's training. Um, he's joining Xavier Miller. But, so that's undermining Xavier Miller now, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, look, it, it seems to work for Joshua. I don't know what the setup is. Um, I don't know what the setup is where he's running, but I don't think he. I don't think he necessarily 
knows what he wants. But I'm not sure whether he's got a plan in place or the people around him that are going to tell him what's the best setup. I'm not sure whether he felt that Xavier Miller didn't maybe prepare him as well enough as he wanted for the first fight. So you know what fighters do, right? They're going to get in somebody else so they feel like they're doing something different from the previous camp. And then if it doesn't work out against Povetkin in the rematch, they've got somebody else to play. Yeah, you could be right there, Rico. You could be uh, right. All right, then I'll throw, throw a few questions at you before we end this uh, video. Uh, just give me an answer to who you think is going to win. Uh, Fury Joshua, who wins? I'd have to say Fury at this point. All right. But I'll, I'll caveat that with one thing. The longer Fury is out of the ring, the longer, the more chance Joshua has. Yeah. Because I'm not sure whether Fury, yes, you know, he's got Sugar Hill living with him. Yes, he's in the gym. He's looking in decent shape. But the game with Fury is and what Wilder and team uh, Heyman and Shelley Finkel are playing is keep him out of the ring as long as possible because he'll start spiraling. Before they make their move legally. Well, they're making it legally, but these things. <coughs> You know, take ages, right? There's yeah. a backlog of legal cases that need to be run in arbitration, and it could take another 12 months to hear. I've been case. told this morning exactly the same thing from somebody who knows a, a lot about it, and they're saying, "Look, he could Tyson could be two years out of the ring. Well, he's a year out of the ring in two weeks, isn't he? Yeah, we could, we mean, could be talking about this in another year. They can make the fight and announce it and all that, but I don't, I don't see it happening this year." I think there's there's no crowds and there's legal issues and I don't think Joshua's hundred percent ready for him yet. Anyway, he looked frightened to death against Paul left, didn't he? I thought he boxed quite well, but you know he's still he's still he's still worried about what's coming back, right? Which is understandable, right? Mm -hmm. He's been stopped and knocked out by Ruiz, and then he was dropped by. Klitschko, I think he's still figuring out what the best way for him to fight is. But I think, I don't think he's afraid of Fury's power, but part of the pub, but part of the challenge for Joshua is, if he's going to win that Fury fight, he needs to take risks. All right then. Uh, here's another one for you. White, Povetkin. Two. I'll, I'll go with White, because I went with White the first time, and yeah, Povetkin knocked him out with one shot, but I'm not going to drastically change my opinion and say that uh, Povetkin's a lot better than we thought because at the end of the day, Povetkin more or less lost to Michael Hunter. Um, I don't think White's a particularly good fighter, but I don't think, at least now, I don't think he's going to improve outside of Mark Tubbs not training him. But I don't think Povetkin's the bogeyman that everybody's talking about. He's 42-year-old or something. 40, 41? 41, yeah. And as, as Porky would say, 42 is next birthday. 43 next year, Povetkin. <laughs> Povetkin's 43 next year, he's older than me. <laughs> All right, then what about Dillian White against Yui? I think Yui would win. He's yeah. a better boxer. He's yeah. a better boxer. I mean, look... Um, Boxers beat punches and White is the thing about White is White can't keep up the pressure and White can't keep up the punch output to keep you off. And he's only going to improve whereas White with his training situation is probably just going to decline, right? Yeah. Uh Billy Joe Saunders, Callum Smith. I'd I'd have to say Callum Smith. Uh Billy Joe Saunders Canelo. Just looking at recent fights, I'd have to say Canelo. Billy Joe Golovkin. I think if Billy Joe puts on his best performance, he can beat Golovkin now. Golovkin's there for the taking. On point. I mean, he looks he looks pretty muscular currently, so I wonder whether he's on the Kovalev diet at the moment. Never yeah. seen him as lean as before, but yeah, I think Billy Joe uh, in his in his on his best night, can beat Golovkin. I don't have much faith in no. Golovkin so, at the moment. Tony Bell, you on drug cheats? Consistent. Hanging them sometimes. If it's a matchroom fighter, he'll say, um, he knows the guy so they can't be taking anything. 
What about Kid Gallard being a drug cheat fighting Tony Bell? Who's fighting Yazzie Dickens? Will Tony uh, take his percentage of the money on the night? Of course he will. That's what managers do. What about Molina on uh, Mushroom Card? Is he a year after? Uh, year or eighteen month, months after Patrick Day, we've got Molina against Fabian Wardley, don't we? Yeah. Uh, a drug cheat. Molina's a drug cheat, is he? Yeah, didn't he get I caught? He went uh, over the counter substance. Oh, a banned substance, wasn't it? Well, a banned substance, a banned substance. We have to be consistent. Yeah, you know when they all they say, oh, it's a banned substance, but he can buy it in a sports shop or a nutrition shop. It's still well. Where do they think steroids come? They're all mixed together. They're all banned, aren't they? I don't get that one, do you? Well, uh, yeah, you know what? I get that one because it's just you've got your excuse. Yeah, you've got your excuse of why you fought. I, you know, you've got your explanation of why you've been caught. So, you know, if you get caught for doing X drug, Nandrolone, let's say, or you get caught for testosterone, you find substances that you can buy from shops to have that. And then you say, oh, it's only traces. I bought this or, you know, somebody gave me a sports drink or somebody gave me this thing. It's not my fault. As an athlete, it's your job to know what's in the stuff you take. Exactly. Like Chris Eubank Jr. has got the best thing about that. He doesn't even take any whey supplements or anything. He just drinks water and he has vegetables and meat and taters and all that. He's got like a 1930s diet, what fighters had in them days. And, he, and he's stuck to it, apparently. So, so he says. So. Yeah, and Senior, I know on this live chat between Calais and Sauland, he was, Calais was saying, or Chris was saying that he doesn't put on much. Like he doesn't really put on much weight and also because he doesn't drink alcohol or do anything. So he's always like more or less on weight. But then Senior was saying when you're speaking to, well, sorry, Kale was saying when you're speaking to Senior, a Senior just never took anything that he's like, it's all overrated that fighters just do the stuff to get a mental edge. But if you eat the right things and train and live a good life, you don't need, I mean, look at Hagler or Hearns or these guys. They didn't really need much of, other stuff did they they didn't need supplements they didn't need sports scientists they didn't need nutritionists they knew what to eat and they trained up so we've got dylan white fighting povetkin the is it povetkin three tests dylan two tests you know question marks against them all they both serve bans for drugs then we've got fabio wardley who were a former white collar fighter against eric Molina pushing 40 a school teacher was a drug cheat who oh, we got on the on, on, on the card? Campbell Atten, whose dad's famous. He's making his debut against TBA. They're your top three fighters on that show. Uh, is there a female fighter on that show as well? Um, let me check the Wardley. Yeah, let me check. Wardley might be on another. Wardley might be another card. But yeah, it's not. It's not pay per view worthy card. You have Ted Cheeseman, JJ Metcalf, and you have Yusuf Kamari, Kane Baker. Yeah, and there are no females on that pay per view. No, no. But I mean, got, how many drug cheats are on that show altogether? Then three out of the uh, twelve fighters. Three out of twelve are drug cheats, and we've got Eddie and we his crocodile tears going on about drug cheats. All right, then uh, I'll tell you what we'll finish off on. We'll finish off on uh, the sad news that that Michael Norcross died, didn't he? The mm-hmm. guy from Essex. Yeah, uh, which is really sad. It just shows you that you can be wealthy and, and you can it cannot work out for you, doesn't it? But the I, I have a lot of emails on this. I don't want to go too deep on it, but a lot of people seem to insert be inserting themselves into that scenario because it were trending at over the millions, wasn't it? Yeah, and and people were putting themselves into the scenario and making statements. Do you think that's in bad taste? Because when the guy put the tweet out, 7.17am, hardly anybody said anything. But then once he died, everybody had plenty to say, didn't they? Yeah, look, it's a very tricky subject. I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's been confirmed what he passed away from. uh, So I won't speculate on that. Sad news for his family though, isn't it? Yeah, it's sad news. I think a lot of people in boxing knew him because he was quite involved in that. that. I've seen him many times at Frot shows and that. Yeah, from what I hear, he's, or what I hear and see, everybody seems to say that he's a stand-up guy and a true gent. Um, 
I'm sure Mickey Theo probably knows him, that neck of the woods. He lives near me. He do I live yeah. near me? Like, I mean, he used to have his yeah. car washed at one of Mickey's places, and I think he's had. Uh, I don't know if Mickey. Who would it have bought a Bentley off Mick? Peter Sims. Sorry, Peter Sims yeah. bought a Bentley off Mick. It won't make you need it on all costs. But down that way, you know, they're all. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's one of these things that if you knew the guy, I understand why you do it. But I think it's just society in general, right? Like every emotion or everything's done for public, right? Like yeah. people will say, people post for public, like, oh, if anybody has any, if any of my friends have any problems, call me on this number. Um, you know, there's other ways to do it. If you knew the family, you can send them a message. Yeah. Um, you can use that to say, to talk about actual mental health. And, you know, I, I, I give Eddie a lot of stick, but he did tweet afterwards or he put on Instagram something like a lot of people up. This shows that a lot of people are going through tough times. Here's the numbers that you can yeah. call. You know, there's a lot of things to do, but I do understand where you're coming from, that this public idea or where the people are coming from let's publicly insert ourselves to this and jump on this for likes. Well, nobody said uh, anything, right, until Eddie Earn put his tweet out and then people were sending him screenshots and you got the usual people tweeting because uh, and uh, most of them didn't even know the guy, mate, and they're all giving their opinion. And I'm like, why didn't... It's very, just... it's, very, it's very sort of... It's not a boxing thing only. It's just a larger society thing. Like, you know, when Caroline Flack, uh, passed away and people were saying be kind and you know all this stuff and then the next day they go and live in their lives as normal and I think the message there is probably that you know watch out for your friends and you know check that they're okay and check that they do well in these distressing times because I think everybody's having a really tough time. You think that's a bit rich coming from Eddie though considering that there's fighters who he's got I'm not going to mention any names but there's fighters who or at match or we're not getting the their uh, slots on and what about is that being kind to them when he's got his favourites who he deals with and, and everybody else is starving and they're not earning they've got families and mortgages but yet he's looking after a select few is that being kind as well because we can strip that bear can't we when we want yeah I mean look, it's, personas of some of these people it's not once you scratch the surface it's not what you think what they say on social media and what they're at, what they're at, how they run their lives behind the scenes is not how they're portraying it. And I have a problem with that, me, mate. All this, yeah, be kind. yeah, yeah I... we should all be kind anyway, shouldn't we? But the point I want to make is that when people start coming out with this, they're all going to do this and going to do that when somebody's dead. A week later, they forgot about it. Nobody mentioned Scott Westgarth, who died on Steffi Bull's show. Steffi were going to pack in one box and he didn't want to do it. They have to say the right things at the time. He's not packed in. I've never seen Scott Westgarth mention on any of Steffi's tweets, and people send me all of them. Don't yeah. see him mentioned anymore. Why don't they mention Scott Westgarth? Glyn Rhodes gets up in the morning and goes to bed at night and sees Scott Westgarth. He's with him all day, and them kids in that gym, Sam Sheedy, John Fuchs, Tommy Frank, all of them boys, they'll all see that kid. But Kane Salvin, all of them. But nobody mentions Scott Westgarth, do they? Why not? Nobody mentions Ryan Day hardly. Eddie didn't even put anything out at the anniversary of his death. Everybody says things at the time when somebody dies. And I, I don't want to be the the person that has to speak like this because people can say, Porky, I'm already saying that. But I think it needs to be said. It's bullshit, mate. It's utter bullshit. Nobody mentions Scott Westgarth. They all move on with their lives. You're here today, you're gone tomorrow. You know, that's yeah, right. I mean, I, I agree. Yeah, people need to be consistent. Also, yeah, that's it. If I think people also need to do it for the right reason. So don't, you know, don't do I it for PR because that don't wash with me. I'm too too smart for that. All yeah, these PR I, people are trying to make off something that's trending. Oh, it's trending a couple of million. Let's just put a thing on and blah blah blah. Oh, we went in that nightclub one day. And people seem to jump on bandwagon to make themselves look good, but none of them were there looking at the guy's tweet in the morning when he were like obviously upset. Where were them people then, or where were them people leading up to the guy being on a downer? People are coming out now saying, Oh, everybody knew that you had problems, this and that one. Well, where were they? He's probably listened to more people's problems owning a nightclub than anybody, because I know nightclub owners, you're like a social worker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah. a boxing yeah. trainer, isn't it? It's like being a boxing trainer. 
Do you know what I mean? I just think that people doing it for PI, it, it's pathetic. And these people, I can't wait while shows start going long because I don't want them coming around near me, giving me I five in me. Don't come near me, I five in me. You know who you are. I'm on to you all. Don't I five me. And when I when I but when I blank you in public, that's why. I ain't got no time for people like that. Everybody's got enough problems, fair enough, but people milking it like that. I mean, nobody said anything about our good friend Frank, who was up there on my wall with me, his wife dying. Do you know what I mean? Only a select few in boxing have said, have said I've heard and that, but Frank don't need to advertise it or put it out there, but I just think it's wrong, mate. People doing it for PR. I think it's cringe and it makes me sick. It was... It makes me sick to the core, and I think to myself, God, what have I got myself involved in here? What have I got myself involved in it, 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 with this sort of thing? I'm better off with yeah. carpet, aren't I? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, yeah, but Ross, I, I completely, uh, yeah, understand where you're coming from. I think if boxing really is serious about mental health and all this other yeah, stuff, do some about we, it, if it's serious yeah, about drugs, do some donate the money. Is one thing, and the other thing is the board should be looking at programs to help these boxers do uh, during these it. times, right? The, the board, board should be no, Rico, putting they? this as a priority. But we that we, we've said everything there is to say about the British Boxing Board of Control. Oof, God, yeah. But yeah, if if Eddie Hearn promoters boxers are serious about, donate part of your purse to uh, yeah, you know, mental health charities, set something up. I mean, don't just send somebody around with a bucket at a weigh in. A Sky Sports show for send somebody around with a bucket, a collection for Scott Westgarth, because that's not coming from your purses, is it? You know what yeah. I mean? I just said they do that every show with a raffle. So, well, I'll send somebody around with a bucket. That's from Matt Schumer. People deserve better or lose their lives in the ring. And I just think that people like to jump on bandwagon and say the right things and like to be politically correct. I mean, you don't get me commenting about people I've never met. I just, no. Unbelievable, mate. When they die, I just think that people do it to make the sense look good and to arse lick around other people to mm -hmm. give something to talk about. Can go away from me. They, they give me an ulcer. I have enough. A belly, a belly you, right? Bell you. Yeah, give me a belly you ulcer. ulcer. <laughs> Did you see? His hey, listen to this. I was looking for YouTube earlier. Belly has done a fifty-five minute and a belly yeah. sit down. I was flicking through, and I was just seeing a big long one over there, Dave Caldwell going on about his childhood and that, and I was flicking through YouTube. December 5th, 2019, you've got same Dave Caldwell coming out with the same story. And that was 55 minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Everybody's had a tough upbringing, haven't they? Everybody's had it. Oh, we've all got stories to tell, but I just, honestly, mate, it sent me crazy. I think we're all going a bit stir crazy, aren't we? You know what? I'm yeah. better off in jail, mate. At least you know where you stand. <laughs> At least you know where you stand, mate. I'm telling you. No, you can't do videos from there, mate. You can't do videos from hey, there. If I ever get locked up, I could do them on phone, Rico. I could be a, I could, <laughs> be a, I could be a phone card baron. No, you can't. It's pin numbers now, isn't it? But I could yeah. do a, a, a porky uh, laughing luncheon meet once a week. We could do elements at month because I'll probably end up on basic <laughs> regime and you hardly get to spend any canteen. So we could do an elements at month and you could put it out there for me on the channel. I'll get password. <laughs> Brought life anyway, from prison. So. Anyways, my friend, uh, I need to go and get some lunch, but good speaking to you. Thanks yeah. for everybody that tuned in. Make sure Thank you, you for coming. It's one o'clock. We've had, we've had a good hour and 40 odd minutes or some, whatever it is. So, all right, Rico, you take care. Yeah, don't have any nightmares. That's the oh, uh, main thing. My lines, you young man. <laughs> I'll come and see all you. Right. Soon. I'll come and see you soon anyway. All right. Yeah, do, mate. Take care. All right. Speak to you soon. Bye. Sorry about that rant. And there's some things that just get under my skin. And I always feel that on social media, when somebody dies, everybody has plenty to say, don't they? But they don't say anything until somebody else has said something. And I don't, I don't call that engaging. I call it being fake. So if anybody's got a problem with that, come see me. I ain't really bothered about anybody, but just my opinion on that. I know a lot of people feel the same. I know I only had ni 19 emails about it, but... I just think it's in bad taste that everybody likes to want to get themselves out there and put lessons out there in public over something to further themselves on the back of somebody dying. I just have a problem with that. 
So if I'm talking out of turn, I don't care. So, all right, I'm going to get a shower. And then I'm going to watch. Let's have a look. I'm going to try that Harlem Godfather thing on Amazon Prime with Forrest Whitaker. All right. Peace out. Oh, big shout out to Innovation Alloys and Charmwood Kitchens. Big shout out to Charmwood Kitchens. How are you doing? Thank you for your text at middle at night. We will talk next week. Peace.